Awesome. Um, so Gregory, thank you so much for being here. It really means a lot to us to talk to you. Um, we've actually been reading a lot and studying about Selk and um, it's just like a real treat for architects and artists to learn about the work that you do. Um, so I guess to start this off, um, I'll give a little bit of background to this conversation. And um, my name is Jeanette Kim. I'm an assistant professor um, here at CCA in architecture. And um, really the purpose of this event is to bring together CCA students um, from architecture mostly in conversation with Gregory Jackson, um, who's here from the Sustainable Economies Law Center and Repaired Nations. And we're here thanks so much to a program called CCA at CCA, which stands for Creative Citizens in Action. And that is a college-wide initiative that promotes um, creative activism and democratic engagement through public programs, exhibitions, and curriculum connections. Um, so this event is funded by an endowment gift um, to support the Deborah and Kenneth Novak uh, Creative Citizens Series at CCA. Um, so I, among other things, I teach a seminar here at CCA called Urban Imaginaries. Oh, did we just lose Gregory? Oh no, you're there, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Just missed you for a second. <laughs> um, so my seminar is called Urban Imaginaries, and we look at ways in which architecture intersects with social justice in cities. Um, and we do this by studying four main topics, um, property, equity, ecology, and economy. Um, and then thanks to CCA at CCA, we've invited two activists, um, Marquita Price from the East Oakland Collective, who joined us a couple weeks ago, and Gregory Jackson, who I'll introduce more fully in, in a second. Um, to come share their work with us so that we can learn from what activists do. Um, and then they're going to come back at the very end of the semester and my students will present their own findings about how they think architects can sort of hopefully help to act as collaborators with activist groups as well. Um, so we're really excited about that exchange. Um, so before I go further though, I'd like to acknowledge um, where we are in, at CCA and um, California College of the Arts campuses are located in Huichin and Yelamu, um, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, um, on the unceded territories of Chochenyo and Ramatish Ohlone people um, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. Um, we recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted, inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas including their forced removal from ancestral lands and de the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. Um, CCA honors indigenous people, past, present, and future here and around the world. And we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you might be joining us virtually today. Um, so if you're unsure of whose land you're currently residing upon, um, we encourage you to visit um, native-land.ca, the website. Um, so uh, to introduce Gregory more fully, um, Gregory is Gregory Jackson is the Equal Justice Works Fellow at the Sustainable Economies Law Center, um, which is a group that provides um, legal tools for communities to support community resilience and uh, grassroots economic development. Um, he is also co-founder of Repaired Nations, which educates, organizes, and empowers low-income Black youth in the Bay Area um, to launch cooperative enterprises through shared ownership um, and control of housing and businesses. Um, Gregory is also on the steering committee of the Oakland Climate Action Coalition and mentors um, people at Youth Impact Hub. Um, I, um, he's also has a BA in philosophy from San Diego State University um, and a JD from Golden Gate uh, University School of Law. Um, and I just had the total pleasure of working with Gregory a few years ago um, when he was kind of serve, serving as um, community-based organization representative um, in the Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge. Um, and Gregory, I, your work has influenced me like for everything I've done since then, you know, I've, I think I see the, 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 the city through the ways of, of or, organizing cooperative ownership and a, a certain kind of empowerment that is truly kind of rooted in political, economic and kind of cultural power. 
So I really appreciate your influence and I'm so happy that you're here. Um, so how should we start? <laughs> so um, the students have some questions they'd like to ask you. Um, I think because we already started to chat a little bit about what you're doing at Selk, I might just hold my question for now. And Key, I wonder if you could start us off. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so I guess, uh, hi, first off. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, I guess I'm really curious about just kind of like your more like how like how you des um, would define um, law practice and um, I guess I'm thinking about like how you obviously have like such a deep um, rooted connection with the community in Oakland and if it was more so um, your like interest in community activism that led you into like your legal profession or if it was vice versa and if um, through your studies in le and um, like legal advocacy it kind of led you to really see the the vacuum that is in um, community organizing. Thank you. Um, Gregor, your sound just got quite low. You need to adjust a mic or something. Okay. Um, while Gregory is doing that, also I forgot to mention that um, even though the students have you know a series of questions that they um, plan to ask Gregory, I think we can also kind of flow follow the flow of the conversation um, organically. So really at any moment, if you would like to raise your hand on the Zoom interface or go ahead and just um, drop a chat, or excuse me, drop a question or a thought into chat, um, we can definitely follow, follow the flow that way. Okay, is this better? Totally. Okay, fantastic. So um, I was lucky enough to uh, like receive this Equal Justice Works Fellowship, uh, which <clears throat> uh, actually ended like last September, but I haven't updated the stuff on my bio. Mm -hmm. um, but what was uh, awesome about that fellowship was that I was able to uh, like plot out what I wanted to do for two years. Um, and I guess my thesis behind like doing all of the community organizing uh, was that there wasn't enough people in my community who like knew about cooperatives and like wanted to engage in them. Um, and so I've like devoted a lot of time towards like, you know, offering that information and uh, anyone who wanted to learn more and like deepen their knowledge, like was able to set up like one-on-ones or recurring things to keep the momentum going um, outside of the workshops and the book clubs that were held like semi-regularly. Um, so for me, like the law is a tool um, that can be used either like negatively or positively. And um, I've chosen to like, I don't really touch the, uh, how would I call this? The adversarial like legal system part of it. Um, like I believe like it's to not curse bogus. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I, I, have strong, <laughs> I have strong opinions about uh, like the roots of this country, the ways that laws have been used to like subjugate and oppress um and uh yeah that's how i solve my uh how do i say uh dual mindedness around it but like i don't even touch that stuff and like i'll tell everyone that like i don't agree um but in terms of like uh business law um and like stuff around like cooperative corporations um in my opinion like capitalism is mainly 
or the way capitalism has been used has been to like extract wealth from one place and direct it into another. Um, we're seeing now with like large pots of money being like concentrated, um, not just in like countries, but also into like individuals and families. Um, I guess I'll, I'll say uh, this is a long answer, but uh, like the re we chose the name Repaired Nations for the organization uh, because we felt like there's a lot of brokenness um, in our society. Um, and uh, I think it's easiest to start with the economic piece because that has an ability to like help unlock um, like opportunities in other spaces. Um, and capitalism and, you know, the way that this society has been working has been oftentimes extracting value from like certain communities. Um, and so what Repaired Nation seeks to do and what my law practice, I guess, uh, the way that I practice law seeks to like move through the world is by helping like small groups of people uh, come together and like gain financial freedom in a way that isn't extractive or exploitative. Um, I think that uh, it's important for us to like realize the value of our work, but also not perpetuate the problems that got us here. Um, and I believe that once enough like small groups of people are, have come together and like found that version of financial freedom, like through worker cooperatives, let's say, um, that will allow for them to both like, well, it'll free up their time and, and increase their income in a time when like the average median wage hasn't like increased substantially for decades. Um, and I guess, uh, I don't want to be long-winded, <laughs> so I'll stop there. Uh, does that answer your question, Key, or did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I guess it kind of made me think of what, like, the essence, like, where it's, like, defining, like, what what it means to be a lawyer, and I guess it's, like, I think maybe, like, I'm in a courtroom, and I'm, like, fighting, you know, and making arguments, um, where it's, like, when I've read a little bit about your work, I guess I kind of seem like a lot of what you were doing is, like, policy writing and, like, advocacy, and I'm just kind of, like, wondering, like, what does it mean to be a lawyer, and, like, what, yeah, what is, what is a law firm, and I guess maybe I just don't, totally know the world of, of law at all uh, maybe i can uh like preface this with like what the sustainable economies law center is um so it's this like kind of national organization um we have staff in mostly california but also like north carolina and i think idaho and a few other places um and we focus on a range of different topics, everything from worker cooperatives, housing cooperatives. Um, oh, okay, hold on. Uh, composting, um, electricity. Um, there's policy in there as well. Um, what else is there? Uh, there's like this radical real estate law school that's happening as like a version 2.0 of uh, this initial program the law center did to take advantage of a California law that lets people get their uh, law license without going to law school. Um, uh, uh, there's, there's work around like securities law and helping people like raise money, um, retirement funds and helping like make those more uh, cooperative, um, farm, uh, and so, like, my work mostly focuses on, like, worker cooperatives and housing cooperatives. Um, and the way that that manifests is um, someone will come uh, to me and say, like, hey, like, I have this business and uh, I want to, you know, start, I have this idea and I want to start this business. Um, and so there's a need to, like, help them incorporate and, like, make sure that they do that right so that their business is on firm footing. Uh, there's a need to help draft up the legal documents that govern the company. And those are the bylaws or the operating agreements. 
and that will you know say who has authority, how money is is regulated, and what happens if things go awry. Um, and then, in, like past that point, uh, I could be helping with like licensing. Um, could also like be supporting someone with raising funds, um, and that could be like you know reading through and supporting with loan documents. Um, it could be like helping to create um, agreements for folks to like invest equity into a business. Um, let's see, what else? I, I don't really go into taxes so much because it's a <laughs> it's a really heavy field that um, yeah I, I let other folks do. Um, but I guess it's a little amorphous in that. It's mainly helping businesses create the infrastructure they need so that they can be successfully running businesses. And when you're a cooperative, there's like this large hurdle at the beginning of like learning what is a cooperative if you haven't already, and then figuring out, okay, now that we know this, how do we actually want to structure that so that it fits our needs? And so, you know, that it, uh, let's see, I just supported a uh, real estate cooperative, uh, the Okanda that I mentioned earlier, um, to create its bylaws. And that was maybe a five-month process, um, even if we're working off of templates, because there's a lot of things, well, it's like the constitution for the business. And so, like, that's where you're going to look to see if something's okay or not. And there's a lot of things to talk through and make sure that it fits for everyone. Uh, so that's essentially what I've been doing outside of the education piece, uh, which has been like um, hosting book clubs like once a year for about three months. I'm on a book called Collective Courage by Jessica Gordon Emhart. It talks about the history of cooperatives in the black community since about the 1700s to the present. Um, and then additionally, um, like these work, like uh, what we call think outside the boss workshops, which teach folks like just like the basics of how to start up and do cooperative stuff. I um, mean, then there's like more technical assistance that is a uh, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, most recently, um, Repair Nations was invited into the Seed Commons, um, which is a national financial cooperative loan fund network, um, and then so. Uh, I, I think we're becoming the, we're, the organization is becoming this holistic vehicle uh, where we're able to like educate folks like early stage, um, teach them how to go through the process and then support them in getting the funding that they need to implement the idea. Fascinating. I wonder too, if I guess from my perspective, I, one, one way, one thing I take away from your description is that um, you're, your work seems to kind of democratize like legal knowledge and make it possible for um, people who have varied other skills to kind of tap into the knowledge that you have and actually like, you know, empower themselves through that kind of combination of backgrounds. Yeah. I wonder if anybody, um, I'm trying to think, because I, I totally want to hear some Yukta's question, but I also feel like we're going in this direction where we're talking about collectives and we could get into some of the specifics there. Um, Sanyukta, what are your thoughts? Do you want to yeah, I just like kind of add to Key's question here about like following your career trajectory and experience in the uh, field of law, you really wear like multiple hats. And I was just like curious about like what really motivated you uh, to bridge your education, your education in philosophy to uh, law doctorate and like was it a branch of the philosophy itself that made you interested in the nature of law in, in terms of like uh, the relation of uh, relation to human values and the power something like that and so like do you see those soft values being helpful in your justice work recently as a lawyer so kind of like how deal with the philosophical background uh, in education to this very legal and like strategic team Um, yeah, I think oftentimes uh, organizing is like mainly values work <laughs> and it's like a little bit like, well, it's logical when you need it to be, but it's oftentimes uh, very values based. Um, but I think um, 
Yeah, like, and not to joke about it, but like the values are oftentimes like how I build a rapport with the folks that I'm seeking to work with. Um, I think it's oftentimes why people like reach back out after I'll do an education thing because they know that we're resonant in that way. Um, when I was in undergrad, I focused mainly on like economics and political philosophy. Um, cause I was curious, like what things did old white men say that we're still like acting on today? And I also wanted to know if they were talking about stuff from like Africa and you know, that like prehistory, but only like very small bits <laughs> in the beginning and then kind of jumping past it. Um, after getting a philosophy degree, I didn't really know what to do. I knew I had to go to like undergrad or like graduate school um, and chose law. Um, I think because when I was, um, you know, when I was in like high school undergraduate, uh, my dad had a, a towing business. Um, and ultimately that business closed because one of like his major contracts, like basically just said, we're not going to honor this anymore, which got me interested in it. Um, they ended up having to like fight a class action lawsuit because of their practices, <laughs> which makes me feel vindicated. Um, but I think that's what like kind of initially got me interested in wanting to know about it. Um, and while in law school, um, I really didn't like, and it was hard. I, I mean, I did it and I kind of like surprised myself the first year of law school. Uh, but just like reading all of the court cases and like understanding that the laws of today are just built upon court case after court case. And ultimately like we're still relying on stuff from like way, way back. And it's, yeah, it, it's, um, I don't think it would be fair to like act as if that didn't exist or like not, you know, not give voice to it. Um, and I guess ultimately like it's important for people who like are wanting to become business owners to like, I guess, well, I'm not trying to politicize anyone, but I do want to like give as much education as I can. Um, so that like, yeah building autonomy and self-sufficiency, I think, is, is a major goal. Um, and that comes from one of the, like, seven, like, international cooperative principles, um, which I find myself leaning on often. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but let me know. Yeah, it, it does. Uh, thank you for that. Kind of, like, see how... Uh this uh, like it, it's, it's kind of like trying to know the stories within the community itself and like uh, giving like and then educating it through a very like look like legal tool so i guess that really works in, in coordination with it yeah thank you thank you for that maria i wonder if um you could bring forward some of your questions along the lines of cooperative ownership yeah. Um, hi, my name is Maria, and I'm interested in how uh, comparative ownership works, and how the how can you create more of a like o like a sharing ownership and more collaborative. Um, so, in your experience, um, I wonder how how do you approach collective ownership, and how does it happen? Um, for example, like what are the steps? that you take if you're gonna um, go ahead with a project that it has to do with collective ownership. Um, how do you, do you, is there an organization that you approach or you go for first, or do you create a certain organization or group? Um, I guess it depends on the community, but yeah, I wanted to understand more about the, this like collaborative enterprise or comparative um, and how, do, how does that work? Yeah, thank you. Um, like essentially, like the 
word or phrase cooperative is like a set of principles and values and like ways of being, but it can also be like a tax category if you're thinking about the IRS or um, like a, a specific entity type, like here in California. Um, and so I guess like when thinking about doing like some kind of collective venture, like one can either like do it as a partnership. Um, one can do it as like an unincorporated association. One can do it as a, a stock corporation or one can do it as a limited liability company. One can do it as a cooperative corporation and there's like other variations, but, um, and I think with each of those different like options that I named, like you can operate cooperatively within those. Um, and so like, essentially that would mean, uh, one member, one vote. And so, uh, this, like, the key feature of this is like, despite how much someone invests into the organization, they only get one vote equal to everyone else in the organization. And that's substantially different from the way like companies like work by convention, uh, because like typically the weight of one person's like vote is equated to how much money they have in the organization. Or how much stock, or how much stock they've accumulated, um, and so that's why you might hear of like you know like preferred sh no not preferred shares but like majority shareholders like someone who has enough stock so that like you know regardless of what everyone else says they can make the decisions. Um, or if you're like in an LLC, it may mean like you know someone has like 70% ownership of the LLC and then other people share in that, and so like essentially they get to make all the decisions. Um, but in those kinds of entities, you can break away from convention and say like, okay, we know what you know, it would be by default, but actually we want to do this by one member, one vote. Um, the, another key feature of cooperatives, which uh, I think is more so, well, it's not, I think it's like a more of a, an advanced technique, let's say. <laughs> Uh, and it's kind of why I distinguish cooperatives from collectives, uh, because a collective can be making like decisions uh, with each other um, and doing that, you know, doing work cooperatively, but they may not be doing this other piece, which is like sharing equally in the value that's created from that uh, venture. And so, um, for instance, like Repaired Nations, we're a fiscally sponsored project, which essentially means we're a nonprofit. And so even though we operate cooperatively, we don't share in the value that is created by repaired nations outside of our wages. Um, if it was a, like a stock company, then, um, you know, if repaired nations made value, then people would receive back what's called dividends or distributions based on how much stock they have, how much ownership they have in that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's another way to operate cooperatively. So instead of like having one person or, or a small group of people taking out all of the value for themselves, you share it equally amongst all of the people that made that value. Okay, uh, and I have a question um, more specifically about like when you're gonna help someone or a group of people like um, buy something collectively and have like a collective ownership how does how does that happen? How does the money get like how do you collect the money? Is it all through funds or grants? Or do they also have to put it out of their pocket? Like how do you find fund this collective ownership? It's a mixture of everything you said and perhaps some other things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it depends on the context of the company and what they have. So if like let's say like a group of well to do, like well off folks want to create a co-op, they may have enough money in their savings account to just, you know, invest into the money, start the venture, or <laughs> invest into the business, start the venture, and then, you know, continue from there. Um, but for other folks who don't necessarily have the money, um, there are a few different ways. Um, here in California, um, cooperative corporations are able to have community investors. And so that means that, um, 
folks in California can invest up to a thousand dollars without the co-op having to do like a uh, super costly securities uh, registration and stuff. Um, but you can also get a loan. Uh, once you have an entity and a bank account, um, you'll probably need to do like a, a personal guarantee unless you go to a lender that's more mission aligned like seed commons, which doesn't require personal guarantees. Um, you could receive equity investments if you knew people um, who had money um, and wanted to invest um, into the company. Um, you could also do that. Um, so you could crowdfund, <laughs> you could do the Kickstarter or the other kinds of ways. There's a mixture of things like, and maybe if you know some foundations or you've seen a grant, you can go apply for that as well. Um, because foundations are increasingly becoming more willing to give grants to uh, cooperatives. And then after you acquire this, um, I want to know more about like the community agreement and like how do you, what are the pros and cons of like certain decisions and how did the, everyone agree it's okay, this is what you get, this is what you put and you know. Yeah, um, so before any of this stuff that we talked about happens, mm -hmm. you gotta start with the community agreement. Um, and the first one that I'd like to uh, talk about first is asking folks how they make decisions. Uh, because it's not <laughs> like we can assume one thing, or but it's not always like, you know, even what's on paper. Um, so just like, you know, reaffirming that so that every other decision that we make, like has that buy-in is important for me. Um, and then there's a matter of talking about like what kinds of cooperative uh, members do we want? Like who will, who will this cooperative be serving and how? Um, and, you know, there's different ways to set it up depending upon uh, how that is. Um, and once you know, like who the members are, then you can start writing those like corporate governing documents that I talked about, which essentially, you know, gives the outline for what's going to happen in this business moving forward. Um, there's always going to be more to create in terms of like policies and stuff internally. Uh, but, you know, those are like the most basic steps. And then you can start like, you know, raising money, doing all of the other stuff. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You know, it's really clear. Um, I think I'll ask a question on behalf of, we have a um, someone in our seminar who's in a, a very, very different time zone. <laughs> and so um, I might ask his question on his behalf. Um, and so this is Lin Hao. And I know he was, he was kind of, when he was studying Selk, I think he was trying to understand the relationship between like the big global capital economies that we all know about and the kind of scale of um, cooperative ownership that, um, that you're describing and that you're setting up. And so Lin Hao is kind of curious about like, you know, what's the relationship between these scales? Like, is there a hope that one overtakes the other or um, does kind of one even feed off of the other? Or um, like, how do you, how do you understand um, um, the grassroots in relationship to like mainstream economies? Uh, do I have an ability to share? Okay, I do, cool. Uh... There's a really awesome uh, publication by Movement Generation uh, from Banks and Tanks to Cooperation and Caring, a strategic framework for a just transition. <laughs> and uh, all the way at the end, uh, they have this really cool graphic, uh, which I'll talk about. Um, so on the left, it has this, uh, what they call the extractive economy. Um, in, in the center of that is like exploitative work. Um, and around that is like consumerism, a colonial mindset, um, and closing of wealth and power, militarism that's governing, um, and resources that are being extracted and dug up and burned and dumped. Um, and so at the top of the, of the thing, it says to stop the bad um, solutions that are visionary or to stop the bad, build the new solutions that are visionary and oppositional. Um, and in the center of that is a cooperative work, um, switching out a worldview of consumerism and colonial mindset with caring and sacredness, uh, switching out a purpose of enclosing wealth and power to ecological and social well-being, 
uh, switching a governance of militarism and, you know, kind of like fear-based governance, really, uh, to deep democracy. Um, and then switching like this extracti- extraction of resources into a regeneration of resources. Um, and like basically as we like what they're seeking to do is like draw down power or like um, how do I say? They're saying draw down the power because they're understanding that like movements are built like trans locally um, and are really like the the relationships and the and the ways that people like live like just filter out into like from local to national to international and so if we're able to like kind of divest the extraction and starve them by investing what we have um into what we want to see like what's on the right um that's how we're able to do that and there's like this filter they talk about um, using uh, when trying to like move from this divesting into investing, um, shifting economic control to communities, uh, democratizing wealth in the workplace, advancing ecological restoration, uh, driving racial justice and social equity, relocalizing most production and consumption, retaining and restoring culture and tradition. Um, and so. I, I really like this uh, this publication, and I like share that with folks whenever I can. <laughs> so look into it if you're able. But um, I, I think what we believe is that um, the world that we know was built through a series of choices and intentions, um, and the world that we want to see will also be built through that series of intentions and choices. And we have to continuously choose things that don't recreate oppression and extraction. Um, yeah, it, it's it's more than just uh, giving service to it by talk. It's actually like making those choices and then acting upon that. It's really, it's, um, I appreciate that so much. And I think when Lin Hao was raising this question to us the other day, it felt to me like he had this image of almost like a David versus Goliath kind of, like almost this feeling that he was kind of daunted by the scale of, of uh, large scale uh, capital forces. And what you're describing to me suggests that um, um, by kind of removing the source of labor and resources that others actually depend on all the time, one actually has quite a lot of power to redirect it. Um, so e- even the grassroots in that sense has a surprising amount of power. I wonder if um, I could inject a little question into the flow here, um, which is that um, I know you are not an architect, <laughs> but I do, I guess you have, at least in the, the example of, of the project that we collaborated in, um, I know you've had some experience in working with designers and architects. And my students and I, we were all talking last week about um, the way that Selk's own imagery, right? The, the, the beautiful, amazing cartoon diagrams, drawings. Um, they like imagine a space of the city and as well as a cultural space. Um, so we're, we were talking about the way that Selk's own graphics always represent a village, like a kind of town center. So I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts about what, what spaces of the city and maybe what scales of relationships um, you find especially promising that you want to kind of work on? Um, and are there ways in which architects could kind of help, you know, spatialize these new kinds of economies? Um, or, and or are there ways that architects are horribly not useful <laughs> at supporting that movement? Uh, I guess it depends who the architect is working for. <laughs> Ultimately, uh, because if uh, the architect is working for uh, a large outside multinational corporation that probably doesn't give two craps about the local community, but, you know, the numbers are right, so they're going to move there. Like, you know, who wants to, like, interact with someone who already, like, knows what they're going to do, but are checking off a box? Um but I think um, like what, where I'm like most interested or, yeah, what I've been most interested in is figuring out how to get people in place um, to inhabit 
um, let's see, like, no, that's not the right word. How to get people in place from the local neighborhoods to revitalize the commercial corridors that have been empty for so long. Um, and though the, like, I can, I can, I can see it as a corridor. I know that it starts building by building. Um, and I think for, yeah, for, for people like, let's say in East Oakland, where I'm like mostly focused, um, or at least the target audience that I'm thinking of, uh, like that, uh, like that, uh, how do I say annual income of that like audience is about $40,000. Um, and so I think like folks just aren't used to thinking long-term or like big scale or believing that it can happen. Uh, but like in, in like trying to like, uh, develop a property that was close to my uh, close to my house here in East Oakland and like gathering others uh, to try and do that as well. Um, just realizing that we're ultimately selling a story to the funders or to whomever um, and getting them to buy in. Um, having visuals is like usually more helpful than not in terms of like getting folks to engage and like maybe give credence to an idea. Um, so I think in that, in that sense, um, like architects can be helpful with, uh, um, let's see, helping to synthesize community vision into uh, something that can be seen um, and maybe more easily acted upon. Um, yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. It's like maybe there's a tangibility that's enabled by, you know, by yeah, by visualizing that. Um, checking, can I pull you in? <laughs> yes. Um, so I know um, beside the SELC, um, there's also the Repair Nations is for achieving uh, the sustainable economic security for the Black Youth. Um, I wonder what, why is separate from the SELC and like how it's bringing um, the power to the Black community and what new connections can be built with other communities and also how these um, consequences that related to the self perceptions and image of the Black community. Um, let's see. So it's, it's separate because, um, like, honestly, when I proposed that, you know, it'd be a part of the law center a few years ago, it wasn't accepted <laughs> that proposal. And so, you know, me being who I am, I'm like, yeah, I'm doing this anyway. So I went to go do it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so that was that. Um, but I think it is important for it to be separate um, and for, I guess, uh, like communities to feel a sense of ownership around like their own things um, because there's a perception, if not a reality, that um, when there are outside owners of uh, someone else's thing, they may tend to want to impress their thoughts or opinions um, upon that thing without seeing it for what it is. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I think most Black people feel uh, <laughs> is, uh, autonomy and independence is important. Um, and not putting oneself in a position to uh, I don't know how to say. Uh, I don't want to say what's in my head. Uh, what's another <laughs> word for this? Uh, uh, it's important for, I guess, it's a, I'll just say, it's important uh, to not put oneself in a position where 
uh, we will be forced into like subservience. Oh, that was better than what I was in my head. <laughs> yes. Um, and so um, I think that ultimately Repair Nations will be um, a separate, like a completely separate organization. Um, but where I was at in like 2016, uh, when I submitted the application, uh, to get the fellowship to start it. Um, I just wasn't in a place to do it on my own and I needed uh, the help of like, a, an aligned organization and so was that aligned organization. Um, and I guess as the organization continues to grow and like repaired nation staff get like more and more upskilled and like feel more and more confident, like leading the work, um, we'll like you know start planning for like what a cooperative can look like um doing the same work uh, rather than being a fiscally sponsored project thanks gregory that's really great to hear um actually do you mind saying a bit more about what makes a repaired nation project because i guess if both both selk and repaired nations projects look into cooperative ownership is that correct um, what are some of the differences? Um, unapologetic focus on Black people. Like Silk is multicultural, like everyone come and learn and like, let's build this amazing thing. Uh, Repair Nations is like, uh, how do I say? <laughs> I, I guess we espouse different values or like needs for doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's mostly talking about um, like supporting like black communities to like gain economic independence so that we can, you know, move autonomously and independently as opposed to being chained to a nine to five uh, with depressed wages um, and likely oppressive working conditions uh, that don't lead to the happiness of anybody. And when you're working with repaired nations, are you are you mostly reaching out to people or are they coming to you? Like, how do you define the community that you're building in that sense? Um, so the way that we have it structured right now is there's a small advisory board, um, which doesn't really do anything. Uh, there's a leadership committee uh, that's full of like the staff members and me like doing the work. Um, there is a projects committee, um, where we keep track of the different, um, like ventures that we're supporting. Um, and after a certain time, they become members of repaired nations. Um, there is an education committee, um, where people who aren't necessarily staff, but are supporting our education efforts are counted as members. Um, and yeah, those are the primary member categories. Um, I think in the beginning of our work, we were primarily like reaching out to folks and trying to get people involved. And I think we're still doing that to be honest, but there's also like a mixture of like supporting the people who have been around and have been requesting support and helping them like continue to like build toward the place that they're seeking to get. Um, so yeah, I, I think Repair Nations is more so like technical assistance and like also growing into an investment vehicle, whereas the Sustainable Economies Law Center is like focused primarily on like client work and policy work. Interesting. Um, I know we're coming up to the end of our time together. Um, is there anybody else who wants to say or ask anything? And um, Peter, that includes you. I wasn't quite sure <laughs> uh, where, where you wanted to come in. And also Gregory, is there anything else that you want us to know about you or just kind of share with all of us? Rhonda. Yeah, hi. I know I came in a bit late into the uh, webinar, I'm sorry. Um, I have a, a question. Um, for uh, you, I, I wanted to know if uh, 
you know, and this whole, uh, since the pandemic started and before even that, then, um, that we've had a lot of closures of uh, businesses, um, different kinds of businesses, actually all sectors. And um, it was interesting because I saw, uh, I read about an example. I, I live in San Diego. I don't know where all of you are, but uh, there was a, a big uh, guitar shop. Uh, these two folks had the two guys um, started a, a guitar shop about 35 years ago, and they actually make the guitars uh, there, and they're very popular. And then because of the, the retirement age plus the pandemic kind of uh, did them in, uh, they, instead of uh, just declaring bankruptcy and closing shop like many other businesses have done, they turned it into a co-op, and the the now uh, the workers are the owners and they stayed on of course to uh, guide them through the whole uh, transition and i just thought i mean i talk about this and i have like the goosebumps you know i think i know in other countries uh, especially like spain i'm not i'm half palestinian half argentinian so i know in argentina of course in palestine there are and wherever we are in exile we, it's like it's not officially called a co-op but it's like everybody and their uncle is, is in it. Uh, but the, in Spain, there's very, uh, uh, there's a good movement, you know, very strong movement of co-ops. And I know in the US, I know some good examples, like there's a, uh, I lived in Berkeley, so there's the, um, a few co-ops, there's, there's a bakery co-op downtown Ber uh, Oakland and the uh, co-op in Berkeley, the um, cheese and, and I don't remember anymore what it's called. And uh, I was wondering if, uh, um, do you see any more movement in that direction? Because I think it's very interesting. The infrastructure is there, the employees are there, the experience is there, and the old owners are willing maybe to uh, kind of uh, put their sweat equity and uh, into, the, into the continuation of the business. I think as a, as a model, it would be a great model here for the US. Yeah, definitely. Um... There's a concept one of my coworkers told me about the silver tsunami, which is supposed to happen when all the baby boomers retire. <laughs> like um, me. <laughs> I guess, <laughs> um, but I, I think that, uh, well, there's tons of examples of like converting over into a worker co-op, like uh, the law center is working on some now. And um, my coworker, Jay Cumberland is like more so familiar with that. Um, but yeah, I, I think that uh, especially in the depression uh, or depression times, yeah. um, co-ops tend to thrive. Um, like just, <laughs> it's kind of, uh, it, it feels weird or uh, kind of, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite compute maybe, but what, what I've seen in the readings and my understandings is that um, like when times are hard, people remember that like, oh yeah, we can work together and we can save on expenses and stuff. <laughs> and so like there's a proliferation of co-ops and mutual aid societies so that we can support each other with, uh, you know, what have you. Um, but for established cooperatives that are coming into like depressions or recessions, um, they also tend to do better than um, like conventional companies because like essentially a worker co-op, all of the employees are a substantial amount of them are also owners. So we can choose to reduce our, um, our mm -hmm. annual income by five, 10% so that we don't have to lay anybody off. But right. in a, like a, in a conventional company, they'll lay everybody off and then say, we, we got 15%, <laughs> like we, we did it. And so, uh, there's some like key distinctions that, you know, when people are allowed to make people based decisions, um, we can all thrive. I have, uh, sorry, I don't know. I hope I'm not taking time from anybody else. Uh, also, the, the whole idea of co-housing, I know because, I mean, there's a, so many crises here, of course, in the U.S. like anywhere else. But the issue of housing also is a big, a big crisis. And uh, it's kind of, they go together, housing and work and where do you work and where do you live and who takes care of your kids, you know. And as we grow older, we're seniors. I mean, we shouldn't be thrown in the garbage. I mean, there's a value to us as well. Uh, and uh, I was just thinking also if there are any models of uh, uh, like joint kind of 
the same way developers develop uh, work, live work uh, um, spaces, especially in gentrified areas. Um, why, I mean, are there examples of co-ops that also produce housing co-ops that produce um, uh, income as far as it could be a, a cottage, you know, small cottage factory uh, type mm -hmm. thing. Uh, um, yeah, I'm just wondering. So, uh I guess I should start off by saying that just because something's cooperative doesn't mean that it's necessarily non-extractive, unfortunately, because like it's the people, people can still like, like divide up the money um, equally amongst themselves, but like screw over everyone else. So let me, let me just say that because it can be true. Um, and in New York, um, there's actually like over 200,000 cooperative apartment units that you probably like, wow, but they're all super expensive and like market rate and like, who's going to be able to afford that now? That's why I preface it with that. Um, but I think that there are awesome examples of like, you know, just people from the community being able to purchase homes. Um, there's a, a lot of tenant opportunity to purchase or TOPA um, acts coming out across um, the nation. Uh, Oakland recently did one. Um, I think the law center put out a, a what would this be a, a newsletter or an example about how like the first one recently happened with a client they were working with who was able to like you know purchase their property through this thing. Um, so that's a that's an avenue that you know individuals, cooperatives, or land trusts can do. Um, it's here in Oakland. It's also in Berkeley, I believe. It's in Washington D.C. Um, and so there's there are places implementing that. Um, there's also um, an interesting like cooperative uh, type model in uh, Boston called the Dudley Street Initiative, uh, where they were able to um, come together as a community, um, like get a bunch of distressed properties and then renovate them for the community or to, to rent back to the folks who were there but needed better housing. Mm -hmm. um, there's an instance in uh, Buffalo, New York of a co-op or they're called co-op buffalo or push buffalo um they've they've done they've actually gotten policy passed so that they could as a cooperative like renovate homes that were distressed and then move people into them in buffalo and so mm -hmm. there's a lot of instances of people figuring out how to you know do all of this but it's not always um you know on the front page i feel yeah, like there's so much I'm, I'm interested in that too, because I've been thinking also, um, I have a, a Parkinson's disease among other things, but there's a big, also the need, like you look at nursing home, you look at um, uh, institutions like that, that are really very expensive and that they're not providing the kind of services that individuals need. So I was I was thinking about co-ops also in terms of people who have similar needs like as we grow older and stuff instead of just putting people in old folks' homes. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. There's, I don't know if there's any examples of things like that that people, yeah. let's say, in uh, they have LS or uh, different other diseases, you know, that are maybe forming co-ops so that they can centralize services. Uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Really fascinating. Yeah. I um I feel like there's so much more to talk about, but I also <laughs> want to respect that. Um, yeah, I, was, so I guess we were supposed to finish up at four thirty, <laughs> um, and I feel like we're just getting going. Um, and I saw that Leandra just added a really fascinating question about the difference between cooperatives and nonprofits. Um, so maybe with uh, sort of some of these questions, does anybody else want to add any last thoughts into the mix before we? Maybe we could give Gregory like a last word if there are any other little things uh, that he'd like to pick up on. Um, any other burning questions or responses? <laughs> cool. Well, Gregory, um, if you'd like to respond to um, Rhonda's point about you know aging in place, maybe, or the question of cooperatives and nonprofits, um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. But otherwise, we don't want to keep you for too much longer. OK. Well, um, I've enjoyed speaking with you all. Um, unfortunately, I don't know about any um, like cooperatives geared towards that, but if something comes up, I'll send it to Janet and she can send it over to you. 
Um, the uh, difference between, well, a nonprofit is uh, restricted in the activities that it can do. Um, it's restricted to the like, charitable purpose. Um, and that can mean um, like education or science. It can mean like fixing a deteriorating community, but it has to like fit within like one of those like boxes. Um, and then furthermore, um, any of any like money that a nonprofit like receives, um, it can only uh, use that money to pay for wages or to reinvest into programming. Um, it can't distribute that money out to like members if it has members. Um, a cooperative, on the other hand, um, like when it receives money um, or like makes money, um, you know, it can pay the wages, um, it can reinvest in the programming, and it can like distribute like excess earnings or value uh, to its members. Um, and so like oftentimes what that means in practice is that if you want to operate as a nonprofit, there's a lot more restrictions um, that you, and paperwork that you have to like, um, like muddle through. Um, and uh, there's usually like less that you have to worry about for um, for profits, which are part of a cooperative. Love it. Um, thank you so much. And uh, it's like a, it's a treat to be able to do this and then to have you come back and kind of talk a little bit more about where design um, thinking maybe overlaps with the work that you're doing. So um, really, thank you um, a thousand times and maybe a round of applause for Gregory. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Cool. I appreciate you. you soon. Thank, thank you for, for Rhonda. And, um, thank you. I'm um, sorry. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Um, so for everyone in the seminar, oh, I'll stop recording. <laughs>